From the deserts of the east, a thousand years ago, arose a mighty empire. Within a hundred years, it had become a medieval superpower. Its unifying language was Arabic, and its religion, Islam, lay at the heart of its power. Much of the knowledge and many of the inventions produced by the Islamic world are still with us. For example, what has this piece of ancient technology got to do with this? My bicycle! Master carpenter Marty Jobson and I will recreate and test some of the early Islamic world's most amazing inventions. Roving reporter Amani Zain is going to travel to where it all took place. She'll be exploring the stories behind the golden age of Islamic discovery. At its height in the 10th century, the Islamic Empire was so vast that it stretched from Spain all the way east to what is now Pakistan. The ideas and the inventions of the Muslim world have had an enormous and lasting effect on the world we live in today. Islam was born in the searing heat of the Arabian desert. Most of it is a vast, featureless ocean of sand, scrub and rock. The early peoples of Arabia were nomads who travelled the sands on camels. With little or no landmarks, it was vital to know where you were going. It was too hot to travel during the day, so journeys were undertaken in the cool of the night. In the cool of the night, the only things to see were the stars, and as they remained constant, it was a short step to learn to navigate by them. Astronomy was virtually abandoned in the Europe of the Middle Ages, but in the Islamic Empire, the science flourished. Across the Islamic world, from the deserts of Arabia to here, Al Hamra in Spain, these early astronomers probably worked from minarets in mosques just like this one. Their understanding derived from the direct observation of the stars, so they began to understand exactly where the Earth sat within the universe. One of the greatest of these men was El Sufi, who in the 10th century named all the visible stars. The Arabic names like Aldebaran, Altair and Algol are still in use today. But probably the greatest feat of Islamic astronomy was achieved by al khujandi He was able to complete the most staggering of calculations, which helped close the book on an age-old question. The seasons changed because the Earth's axis is tilted, but by what amount had been one of the great astronomical questions of the day? We get seasons because the Earth is tilted in space. Here we are in space, here's the Earth, the big red ball is the Sun, and this is what's called the plane of the ecliptic. Now suppose the equator was in the plane of the ecliptic like that, then we would have no seasons. But it isn't. The point is the Earth is tilted like that. Here we're tilted away from the Sun. If we were like that, the Sun's rays would be coming much more directly than they actually do in winter. Anyway, here we are, going through the seasons now. We're getting to sort of February, March, April, May, and then finally June. And we've now got to midsummer, and we've still got the same tilt, but now we're tilted towards the sun. So the sun's rays are now coming much more directly, longer days, hotter sun, that's summer. The first chap who realized that the Earth is tilted was Eratosthenes, the brilliant Greek mathematician who lived in Alexandria and worked out the circumference of the Earth more than 2,000 years ago. But he didn't know what angle we were tilted at, and astronomers worked on that for ages. It turns out that what you have to do is to measure the highest elevation of the sun in midsummer, and then the lowest in midwinter. Take the angle between the two and divide it by two, and that gives you this angle of tilt. And it's about 23 degrees. But more than a thousand years ago, a Muslim mathematician and astronomer called Al-Kujandi worked this angle out with incredible precision. 
Advances in understanding the movements of the heavens enabled men like al Kujandi to create the most accurate calendars and almanacs of the age. These were vital for the precise timing of religious rites. The Prophet of Islam is Muhammad and the religious spiritual home is Mecca in Saudi Arabia, but its heart is the Kaaba or black stone in the center of the mosque. Islam means to surrender, surrender oneself to God. It marked the beginning of a new religion, a new civilization, and a new empire. Then, just as now, the Ma'azin calls the faithful to prayer. There are prayers five times a day, at dawn, midday, afternoon, sunset, and evening. Islamic prayer times are astronomically determined and change from day to day. It's vital to know exactly when they are, so the Arabs developed an extraordinarily accurate machine. In the early days, the Arabs got their prayer times from, well, probably sundials or maybe water clocks, but then along came the high-tech astrolabe, and this is it. Well, this is one. There are many, many of them. Very beautiful brass things with dials on both sides, and they work by stereographic projection. That's bringing the heavens down onto the brass plate. And I don't understand how it works, and fortunately, Emily Winterburn does. She's curator of astronomical instruments at the National Maritime Museum. Tell me about the astrolabe. Uh, well, its name comes from Arabic to mean star taker. Right, so it literally takes the stars exactly. down. Exactly, yes. yeah. This bit is, is basically the stars flat. Right. So what are all these little pointy, the little pointy bits mm -hmm. sticking off? Each one is, is a bright star that you, that you should be able to see easily with the naked eye. Okay. So you've got Aldebaran. Oh, right. Um, and Altair. Al yeah, exactly. And so it's the very point that points exactly. at them. Exactly, the very, very tip. That's, that's where the star is in relation to the other stars. OK. And then this bit here is uh, where the sun is the over, the, over a year. Yeah. OK, so suppose we want to tell the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do first? OK, well, first of all, you find... So if you're, if you're doing it in the day, yes. you find the height of the sun. Well, we don't have any sun. We're typical, you know, cloud. But let us imagine that the mm -hmm. sun is just coming through that window over there. OK. What do we do? You would hold it up okay. by the ring. Like this? Yeah. Right. OK, and because it's the sun, you wouldn't look through it. You would, you would get the sun to shine through... Through, through the holes? Exactly. OK, so I'm imagining... I'm not, I'm not, not looking at the sun, mm. I promise you. And you hang it from your finger so gravity is keeping it vertical, yes? Exactly, yeah. OK, so that's nicely lined up now. OK. There you are. I hand it over to your... OK, so from devices. that, you can, read the de you can read the degree, right. degree scale. So that tells you the height above the horizon that the sun is. Once the height of the sun relative to the horizon has been set against the day of the month, the exact time can be read off from the hour markings around the edge. In our case, it's 8 a.m. Can you use this to predict things? Yeah, you can work out... Uh, when the sun is going to rise and set, so important for Ramadan, knowing when you can eat. Fantastic. Um, you can also work out when stars are going to rise and set. I'm, I'm very impressed. The astrolabe had many other uses, navigating across sand or oceans and measuring the height of buildings. It was even used to determine the alignment of planets for horoscopes. And for Muslims travelling away from home, it was vital. From the angles of the sun and the stars, they could work out the direction of Mecca, and therefore, which way to pray. With the development of instruments like the astrolabe came enormous leaps in all forms of scientific knowledge. At the heart of these new ideas was the principle of direct observation. In order to understand something fully, you needed to see it with your own eyes. One man, Al Haytham, revolutionized the way we see the world by doing experiments in complete darkness. Al Haytham's story starts more than a thousand years ago on the banks of the River Nile in Egypt. A renowned Iraqi scientist, he had been asked by the caliph to regulate the flow of the water. He quickly realized that if the ancient Egyptians weren't able to do it, he wouldn't either. Sure enough, his calculations were wrong. Terrified of what had happened to him, Al Haytham pretended to be mad so that Al Hakim, nicknamed the Mad Caliph, wouldn't execute him. Instead, he was put under house arrest. It 
wasn't all bad. In fact, it suited El Haytham because it meant that he could devote more time to his experiments. And when he did start his experiments, it merely confirmed what everyone thought, that he was indeed mad. Legend has it that he stayed up all night making holes in the walls and spent his days staring at shafts of light. But El Haytham's main interest lay in optical science, and his experiments under house arrest led him to an extraordinary discovery. He was the first one to work out how we actually see. Before about the 10th century, people thought that if you wanted to see something, you open your eyes and send out a sort of beam, a beam of light, a bit like radar, and it would bounce back, and that would give you an image of the object. But Al Haytham realised that that was complete nonsense, that the light's there anyway, it comes from the sun, it doesn't matter if you've got your eyes shut, it's still there. What happens is that when you open your eyes, light streams in, it's like pulling out the plug in the bath and all the water streaming down the hole. The light streams in and you see the trees and everything around you. He was one of the first people to do experiments to test his theories, and so he started off the scientific method. Now, Marty is across there. Marty, can you hear me? Yes, Adam. Woo! Good. Al Haytham actually took round with him a sort of portable laboratory, a bit like this garden shed, really, although he probably used a tent. It was called a camera obscura. The Arab word camera means a private room, and the Latin camera obscura means dark room. And if you look inside, it's completely dark. But there's magic in the air. Now, here we are inside the camera obscura. It's very dark in here, but we've got a hole in the wall. It should be a pinhole, but we've made a bigger hole to let more light in and put a lens in it. And over there is the castle, and over here there's a screen. And if you see, there's an image of the castle. Look, here's the moat, and here's the castle, and here's the battlements, and you will have noticed by now that it's upside down. The battlements should be at the top, and they're at the bottom, and the moat should be at the bottom, and it's at the top. And that in itself is proof that light travels in straight lines, because it means that light from the bottom, from the moat, has come through the hole and gone up to the top of the screen, and light from the battlements at the top has come through the hole and down to the bottom of the screen. Very, very neat. And then we've set up three lamps. You see there are two lamps here together and one somewhere away. And if I ask Marty, he can switch that one off. Marty, can you turn the lamp off? There, it's gone off. And on again. There, you see. Now that is proof that the light is coming from that lamp. It's not from somewhere else, it's not from inside the shed, it's coming from that lamp, through the hole, and onto the screen. Now, for us, that's obvious, because we're used to things being projected, but in those days, they weren't. They hadn't seen anything projected. This must have been absolutely amazing, to see a real image of the outside world. Let me show you it the right way up. Look, if I put my hands over it like this, and just turn the camera around, right, that should be about right. Now, with luck, you'll see me upside down and the image the right way up. And you can see people here walking across to look at the castle. And there's quite a lot of evidence that some of the Renaissance painters, like Canaletto, Reynolds, Vermeer, actually used the camera obscura to make sure they could get really accurate reproductions of complicated things in the world. Because then you can trace things in incredible detail. So there we are, light travelling in straight lines, courtesy of Al Haytham. Meanwhile, in 10th century Egypt, other important advances were being made. Water was precious, and getting it to where it was needed was one of the foremost technical challenges of the day. According to the Greek writer Herodotus, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. But to irrigate their crops, they had to come up with effective ways of transferring their water from one level to the next. This is one of the earliest water-lifting devices, the Shadu, and it's still used in Egypt today. Genius though the Shadu is, it's really hard work. So engineers needed to come up with more efficient ways of lifting water. One of the cleverest was Al Jazari from Turkey. He was fascinated with the innovation and development of mechanical devices. A great engineer and skilled draftsman, he came up with an ingenious device for lifting huge amounts of water without lifting a finger. It's called, snappily enough, the crank connecting rod system. But how did it actually work? The crank connecting rod system was Al Jazari's most important contribution to technology. And I've got one here. This wonderful machine is a pump. 
I'm going to pour water out of the moat through that flexible black hose, pump it through this machine and make a magnificent fountain right up into the castle. Well, in that direction anyway. This is how it works. I'm going to wind this handle and this will turn that gear at the back. These are exactly the sort of gears that Al Jazari used. All right, you can see that going round and that one turns round this gear at the bottom. And as that goes round, you can see that there's a big chunky black pin here. It slides up and down in this black box and it pushes this black box backwards and forwards like that. And that pushes these connecting rods here, backwards and forwards across the circle. Okay, what that does is this. It pushes a plunger along inside this pipe. I don't think Al Jazari had plastic sewerage pipe, but he had something like that. And it pushes water up here through this valve. In fact, he used little flat valves like that made of copper. They will let the water in and then not let it out again. So the water is pushed up there. And then when I pull the plunger back, the water can't come down there, but it'll come up from below through another ball valve. And so when I pull it back, it'll fill the whole pipe again. So there we are, and all we need is an animal to drive it. Marty! Hey, that's brilliant! Oh, oh. That's Marty's coming out all over oh, it here. It does leak a little bit. Oh, wow! Hey, that's brilliant! Oh, that's fantastic! Go on, harder, harder, we want to wet the castle. That is brilliant! This is a fabulous machine, and this is what led to a great revolution in engineering, the principle of the crank which finally ended up with the finest form of transport known to man, the bicycle. Even without the bicycle, the Arabs still had to get around in this arid and unforgiving landscape. As the Islamic Empire expanded, so did the opportunities for trade and exploration. Goods and ideas of all descriptions sailed east and west across oceans of sand and rock, carried naturally by the ship of the desert. By the Middle Ages, long trains of camels were a familiar sight. Called caravans, they helped link the far-flung corners of the Islamic Empire. At the time, the Islamic world was the only medieval superpower to have achieved a rapid military expansion. Within 100 years of Prophet Muhammad's death in 632, Muslim armies had conquered the Middle East, North Africa, Asia and most of Spain. But by the 13th century, constant wars meant that the caliphs in Baghdad had lost most of their power. Three separate dynasties then arose, the Mughals in India, the Safavier in Iran and the Ottomans in Turkey, the longest survivor. In 1922, after the First World War, it was converted into the Turkish Republic. For 1,200 years, the Islamic world was a powerhouse of knowledge, military might and innovation, all driven by the massive economy that spanned Europe, Africa and Asia. The treasures of the world were brought back and sold in the hustle and bustle of great Islamic cities like Cairo. Goods would be sold in suits like these. This is Khaina Khalili in Cairo, and it's not that different to how it would have looked a thousand years ago covered marketplace protected from the glare of the sun, selling everything a girl could want to buy. The markets in Cairo were amongst the most important in the Islamic world. As well as exotic spices, incense, herbs, wheat and grains, there also came something even more precious, ideas. And one such idea pointed the way to a source of limitless energy that didn't need the flow of water at all. A 
Around the world, water has always been an essential source of energy, used to grind wheat. So what do you do when you find you're hundreds of miles away from the nearest river? Almost wherever you are on Earth, you have wind. And with a great leap of imagination, they realized they could extract the energy from that invisible wind. The first reference we have is AD 644, a Persian millwright who set up a mill probably in Western Afghanistan. And it seems that the idea was brought back to Western Europe by the Crusaders in the 12th century. Hey, Marty, it's terrific. And with a vertical shaft. I can't hear a thing. Oh, it's Ooh. very noisy wind in this part of the country, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, it is, isn't it? So, show me how. You've got a vertical shaft. There's a vertical shaft, OK? At the top, there's a bearing at the top. Right. The shaft comes down. And then, sticking out of the vertical shaft, we've got six of these veins. Right. And the veins are actually made of just sort of what Like sails, really? Yeah, they're like sails. They're made of sort of, you know, bits of twig and stuff. Right. And that turns this bit at the bottom. Right. And the really cunning thing is around that side. If you go around okay. there, you will notice that on this side, there is a, a bit of shuttering. To stop the wind? To stop the wind. So it can only blow through this side? Exactly. So it blows through that side, which means that it's only blowing against these Pushing all the sails around this way. So these veins don't get pushed against. So it goes, always goes the same way around. That's very cunning. And of course, in that part of the world, they have the 120-day wind, which always blows from the same direction. So they knew which way to build the buildings, presumably. Yeah. Dead cunning. Now, tell me about the bottom end. Right. OK, the bottom of the shaft, we've got all these gubbins here. This is just your grain silo here. OK. okay so just sort of grain in there. And then when I open that, the grain comes out. OK. And falls into here. OK. And the black discs, right. those are actually the millstones here. These are the grindstones. You've got quite small ones here. Yeah, we've got quite small <laughs> scale grindstones. OK. These things were huge. Now, the really clever bit is what's going on at the bottom bearing, which you can't okay. really see. But basically, the bottom bearing is just a spike. Okay. Sticking this, up into the shaft. This shaft sits on that spike. Okay. okay. And by adjusting that bottom bearing up and down, you can change the position, if I move that out of the way, of the top grindstone. So you can make the gap between the grindstones bigger or smaller. That's really important. The point is that if the gap gets too small and those grindstones are touching, all that comes out is dust and that's completely useless. And if it gets too big, if they get worn away, then the whole grain comes out and it doesn't get ground at all. So it's really important to be able to adjust that gap. Well, I want to grind some grain. Can we run it again? Yeah, sure. More wind! Let's have more wind! There she blows! <laughs> Terrific! Inventions like the windmill spread right across the world, but what came with them was something more valuable even than water or gold, because what the Islamic Empire exported in bulk was knowledge. In Baghdad of the 9th century, the Caliph, al mamun founded the House of Wisdom. It was a vast library dedicated to translating the works of the Greeks into Arabic. He was especially interested in books on philosophy and science. Built in 830 AD, the House of Wisdom contained over 6,500 translated volumes of Greek astronomy and architecture, and over 18,000 volumes of translated classical works from all around the world. Muslim scholars knew that it was vital to find out what scientists from other cultures had discovered, and one famous saying instructed them to seek knowledge even unto China. When a scholar brought the caliph a text he translated from a foreign language into Arabic, he'd give them, in return, the weight of the book in gold, a financial incentive, if ever there was one, to translate the biggest book you could find. Three of the men the caliph recruited to work in the House of Wisdom were the Benu Musa brothers. They were part of a leisured class in Baghdad that were fascinated by trick inventions, sophisticated mechanical devices that were, in fact, far cleverer than mere toys. 
The Benu Musa brothers fed their peers' obsession by designing and making trick inventions of their own. Their book of ingenious devices lists over a hundred. So what were these toys? Were they really just ancient executive toys? Executive toys? Maybe. But those brothers produced a whole lot of devices that were not only witty, but also extraordinarily ingenious. Marty, what have you got? Fancy drink of water first, Adam. That, that's not very ingenious. Well, yeah, here you go. All right, all right. They put huge effort into what are really conjuring tricks. Oh, I'm sorry, Adam. Water run out. Water. That's not very fair. I think I'll pour myself a little glass of wine as well. Uh, yeah. Hang on a sec. You said there wasn't any left. Oh, well, I'll see what we've got left. Marty! Sorry, I have You're a rotten bit. sheet. Well, I'm going to... Actually, I'm really rather thirsty, so I'm going to take a, a second wine glass as well, so... <laughs> that is very clever. So whenever you pour for me, there isn't any. There's none. And when you I'm pour for you, you've sorry. got as much as you want. Yeah. Go on, tell me how it works. Oh, all right, then, if it's you It's a must. trick. It is a trick. It's a Banu Musa trick. Go on, Just then. Just move these out of the way. It all comes down, and I have a convenient see-through version here. <laughs> it's really very simple. It's very ingenious. Right. Actually, the jug has two chambers. It's okay. separated by this sort of wooden plate here. Right. Okay. The bottom chamber is sealed from the air. Okay. That's important. Except for two things. First, there's a double siphon here. This, the sort of C-shaped thing. Yeah, that C-shaped thing there. And right. secondly, there's a hole here. Right. Which goes into the handle, right. along the handle, up the head, up there, and it comes out at the top. Okay. And there's a hole at the top, which I can cunningly place my thumb over. Right. Now, if I take another glass here like this, just move this wine glass out right. of the way. I can obviously pour water out of the top compartment. Because that's just ordinary. Because that's just there. An ordinary jug. But so long as I have my thumb over the hole, it appears to run dry. Ah, because you need air to get in exactly. there to let the water out. Exactly. So all I have to do is release my thumb a little bit like that. So right. I take my thumb off. Right. And now if I pour... Oh, and it comes all the way around through the sea. flooding out through the sea. And then you put your thumb back on. Thumb back on and it stops. So, that's very cunning. Stop. And I'm glad to say they also produced some devices that were rather more practical. One of the brothers' devices that's still in use today is the grab. And according to them, it would extract pearls and valuables from the bottom of the sea and find things that have been dropped into wells and rivers and so on. It's a sort of mechanical... Adam, Adam hold that. I'll show you how it works. Let's get this untangled. Now, this is an incredibly simple device. Right. All it consists of is a pair of jewels. Right. Quite vicious, those two. Uh, yeah, we deliberately did that. Right, OK. Um, it's two half bits of tube with yes. jaws on so that... You can grab things from the bottom of the sea. Okay. Now, this is the clever bit which you've tangled up, which is the stringing of it. Because if I hold on to these set of strings here, right. it stays open. OK, let me okay, hold those. You hold those. Yeah. OK, and then you drop that down to the bottom of the right. sea. When you're over what you want to pick up, you pull on the other string, and it shuts. That's very cunning. Let go again. So that goes down open. Down and then open. when you get there, you pull the middle one, and it shuts. Yeah. But it's not going to work, is it? Yeah, sure it will. We just well, need something to um, pick okay, up. OK, something to... Ah, your pen. Try that. OK, here we go. Right. We need a camera. We need a camera to see this. So, yeah. Are camera you ready? Here we go. Yeah, in you go. Down she goes. Not going to get to the bottom. Yeah. You'll only get a rock anyway. Or an old boot. There, look, I've hit the bottom. So now, slowly, slowly, slowly. You haven't got anything there. I don't believe it. Hey, look at that. It's gold. Well, I'll have that. You get my pen back. Marty! Marty! This is the Alhamra in Granada, Spain. When the Islamic Empire was at its height, it represented its most westerly point. For four centuries, the caliphs of the Nasrid dynasty ruled this region, Andalusia. 
from this magnificent complex of palaces. The El Hamra is also widely recognized as one of the finest examples of early Islamic architecture in the world. Begun in the 11th century, these elegant chambers hide an extraordinary technical achievement. The Beni Musa brothers made many other wonderful devices that played with water, but perhaps the greatest expression of Islamic love of water are fountains. These were a show of ultimate wealth. Water was scarce, and a display like this was regarded as a thing of wonder. Fountains became a cornerstone of Islamic art and architecture. These beautiful fountains in the Lion Gardens of Al Hamra in Spain are nearly a thousand years old. Carved from marble, they would originally have been richly painted, mostly in gold. They are said to be based on a description from the Bible of Solomon's fountains at the entrance of the Temple of Jerusalem. Around the edge of the fountain is a poem written by a poet called Ibn Zamrak. The poem praises the beauty of the fountains and the power of the lions, but it also describes the ingenious hydraulic systems of how the fountains work. And to this day, the fountains work the same, gravity and water pressure. The water to power them comes from over there, snow melt and rain from the Sierra Nevada mountains. Through a system of channels cut into their sides, the water eventually arrives here. The Al Hamra was the ultimate expression of 9th century Islamic wealth and power. Safe within these walls and cut off from the real world, the Caliph and his court were able to enjoy life to an incredibly refined degree. One man who also lived in 9th century Spain left a lasting impression. His name was Zirab, and his influence came not from an invention, but from changing the way we behave. He introduced us to the idea of etiquette, fashion, and fine dining. Zirab was a freed slave who rose to become the foremost trendsetter of his age. He lived at a time when this region, Andalusia, from the Arabic word El Andalus, was the center of a great Muslim civilization. Shukran. Zaydab decreed that meals should start with soup, followed by a main course of meat, fish or fowl, and then finished off with fruit and nuts. He even changed the metal drinking goblets of the day to fine, delicate crystal. So, if you enjoy a good three-course meal and believe in good manners, you owe something to Zareb. Zareb's refinements brought many new fashions to the halls of the rich and powerful. But one of the more elegant changes came about in ceramics and was discovered by the early alchemists. For more than a thousand years, the Muslim countries produced the best ceramics in the world. It all started at the Battle of Samarkand in 751, when people from the Abbasid dynasty captured some Chinese potters. And they said, hey, why don't you make us some lovely porcelain, white porcelain, the stuff that we used to call China. But of course, around Baghdad, all the raw materials were quite different. And so they couldn't do that. And it took them a lot of trial and error to find they could make wonderful white glazes using tin oxide. But then the next stage of the process needed exactly what those alchemists had been waiting for. This may seem like a strange place to find one of the jewels of Islamic art, but behind these incredible gates lies one of alchemy's greatest legacies. Behind this door lies an Aladdin's cave of hidden treasures. These amazing vases were originally used for storing oils and grains, but in the palaces of the caliphs, their designs took on an extraordinary beauty. Those who saw them then 
thought they must have been made from precious metals. So beautiful. Jug of the gazelles. This is an exact replica of one in Alhambra. It's about 900 years old. It's pretty amazing. You can see all the Arabic over here, the calligraphy. Al Ghazal, gazelle. <laughs> stunning. Absolutely stunning. But Islam decrees that eating off gold and silver is a shameful and frivolous waste of money. So the very rich had been forced to look for something else that had the same sheen but wouldn't offend the religion. We're all drawn to beauty and the Islamic empire was no exception. That's why the Arabs invented the technique that makes these clay pots into art, a technique that in those days seemed just like alchemy. In the 8th century, potters working in what is now Iraq developed a mysterious process called luster. This was described as an extraordinary metallic sheen which rivals even precious metals in its effect, all but turning objects of clay into gold. We have our own tame alchemist here, Nick Cager Smith. You don't mind being called an alchemist, do you? No, that's fine. <laughs> Good. And you, you understand how this lustreware works? I do indeed. I've got, I've got two bowls, Adam, here. One for you to decorate and one oh, for me. Oh, excellent. Now, this clay stuff in front of us is a clay paste with vinegar right. and metal compounds in it. Right. And the Arabs applied metal compounds as decoration to glaze and discovered exactly how to reduce it in a kiln to produce something that looked lustrous, shining metal. OK, OK. So that's what lustreware is. It, that's what lustreware is. You ready to turn over yet? Turn yeah. the whole thing over. Right. We've got metal compounds in here. This is, this what is sort of silver and copper compounds right. in here. And when they go into the kiln, they're, um, in this case, silver oxalate right. and copper sulphide. Silver oxalate, copper sulphide. That's right. And we reduce them in there. And when we starve them of oxygen at the critical temperature, we strip off they will the be oxalate. converted back to silver and copper. Right. And they'll settle in a very thin layer on the surface of the glaze. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to rub the clay off afterwards. And what we'll find underneath is a nice, shiny, lustrous layer on the surface. I'll believe it when I see it. You're doing a brilliant, a brilliant job over there, considering that you've got no turning skill. device at all. No, it's the skill that I lack, <laughs> Nick, I regret to say. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do any more to that. OK, so can we put them in? Fine. If is, you'd like to open hot? the door. This isn't hot at the good, moment. Good, good, good. You have to be a bit careful not to ruin your work, don't you, at this point? You've got to be very careful not to touch anything in the wrong place. I'm not going to touch it. Right, I'll lift yours you, up. You can ruin my beautiful... Hard work. Okay, shut now it up. Now we can close up. So this is alchemy in action. Absolutely. After four hours in the kiln at 620 Celsius, Nick has thrown in some pine cones to help create smoke and soak up the oxygen. It's time to see whether the magic has worked. Will those dull clay pots have been turned into gold? They haven't shattered into a thousand pieces. If we hear a loud crack, we know something's gone wrong. Now, I have to say, it doesn't look very beautiful yet. No, it's very muddy and dirty looking, isn't it? We're going to take a cloth... Right. ...and simply and rub, rub off. ...very simply on the surface. I'm just going to... That way. ...just going to rub very slightly... Right. ...on the surface where the clay has created a layer that's amazing, it's, look. It's like Aladdin in his lamp. Look at that. Fantastic. As you wipe the clay around, it'll actually be lightly abrasive on the other surfaces, so you can... Smooth it down. ...happily, happily rub across the whole surface of the piece. Fantastic. Lustrous. Making lustreware was like alchemy. It was like a dark secret that held the promise of enormous wealth. 
but actually transforming things from the ordinary to the truly beautiful was happening all over the Islamic world. Jaber al-Kindi, Razi and Ibn Sina. What links these 9th century Islamic alchemists to Dior, Givenchy, Lancome and Chanel? Well, today's multi-billion pound perfume industry owes it all to a process first developed in search of the fifth element, the quintessence. A process known to you and me as distillation. The allure of fragrant goods is as old as mankind. But special gifts like saffron, frankincense and myrrh were so expensive to make that they were reserved only for emperors and kings. But as the passion for Eastern spices, ointments and essences expanded into Europe, scientists of the empire managed to come up with a novel way of getting from this to this. The Islamic chemists became masters in the art of distillation. Al-Kindi's 9th century book describes no fewer than 107 methods and recipes for perfume making. And even the equipment such as this, the alambic or still, continues to bear its Arabic name. Their ideas eventually migrated here, near Grasse in the south of France. A perfect climate and the right kind of soil has meant that the perfume industry still flourishes here after 700 years. Once the flowers have been harvested, it's now time to distill them. And Michelle here is going to show me how to do it. The water is warmed to just under 100 degrees using a pressurized boiler. The resulting steam traps the essential oil as it passes through the alambic, full of lavender stalks. The water oil vapor is carried up and out of the vat through the gooseneck. The gases then travel around coiled tubes that are immersed in cold water. The cooled mixture condenses and funnels out through a lead-off pipe into a collecting flask. So basically what's happening is the oil is rising to the top because it's lighter than the water. Yeah. And then you're able to drain off the pure oil mix yeah. into this. Exactly. So how much would you make, Michelle? We need 50 kilo of lavender to make one litre of essence. So that's basically about 30 of these bunches that would make one of these bottles? Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of hard work. Yeah, and we need to carry up to pick up some more lavender, so hurry up. These 9th century scholars evolved chemistry from an occult art to a scientific discipline. Their systematic approach led to another distillation discovery that today affects every person and every nation on Earth. It is perhaps the most precious substance on the planet. Who would have thought that this black sludge, known in Arabic as naft, could hold so many uses. Without distillation of crude oil, we'd have no petrol, cooking gas, plastics and diesel. In fact, it has over 4,000 uses. I'm going to distill orange juice and create pure water for your drinking pleasure. Here in the lab, we're going to show just how easy it is to distill anything. This is almost an exact replica of a 9th century still. So that, that's, that's the orange juice in there boiling, which will produce steam. Okay. And then, of course, what happens is the steam comes up, it goes in that hole there, yep. and then it comes into the top part. That's the glass lid. Into the glass lid, okay. Yeah. And then the glass lid, they'll, in round of here, there'll be water and ice. So this will be cold, and that'll condense the steam into water. Okay. Like any still. And then what happens is the water will collect in this trough round here. Inside the glass. Inside the glass. Yeah. And there's a hole at the bottom there and a pipe, and the water will trickle out of that pipe and fall out of the end. OK. And... Like that. Yeah, look, it's beginning to come up. There are drops of water condensing on the inside of that glass down. lid. Water's condensing like mad oh, on that. Steam's yeah. condensing, turning back to water. Hey, this, well, this, this heats up fairly quickly. Does actually. it? Trickling down here and into the glass. Now, look, Marty, I want to taste this. Go on, then. I I've, want I've to got another see. glass here. Ready? Yep. In you go. Now... What's it taste like? Well, it smells Good very faintly of orange or something like really? that, but it's quite clear. It's not orange. I, I can't taste the orange. 
of course, the Arabs distilled all sorts of things, including alcoholic mashes. If you take fermented apples or grain, when you've distilled it, you would get alcohol. It's another Arabic word. They didn't drink it, they used the alcohol for medical things. And indeed, a whole lot of their medical treatments they got by this process of distillation. Here in Cairo, cures and treatments for everyday ills have been handed down since ancient times. This family-run pharmacy relies on a whole range of natural ingredients for many of its cures. Pharmacology took root in Islam during the 9th century when it became independent from medicine. And even in the early days, pharmacists were licensed professionals, threatened with humiliating corporal punishments if they adulterated drugs. Islamic pharmacists became experts in preparing and extracting herbs for medicinal purposes. This, um, this particular herb is um, it's, it's from a plant, but it looks like a scorpion, so that's, that's the name that they've given it. You've got high cholesterol. This is the one that you need to use. This herb um, is grown just on the borders of Egypt, just bordering with Libya. And um, apparently it's, there you are. It's, um, it's for diabetes. It helps people who, um, who are diabetics. These seahorses are apparently used as good luck charms. And also, people have them for, like, vitamins. Oh. My herb man over here has just said that it's very good if you're just about to get a cold or you feel run down. It gives you lots of energy, it gives you a bit of a buzz. Shukran. One of the most eminent of all scientists was Ibn Sina. He was by all accounts a precocious youth. At the age of 10, he knew the entire Qur'an by heart, and by the time he was 16, he was studying and practicing medicine. He wasn't the only famous medical practitioner. al zahrawi was held by many to be the greatest Muslim surgeon of the Middle Ages. He invented lots of surgical instruments, many of which are still used with modifications today. He promoted the use of antiseptics on wounds and described how to remove cataracts, an Arabic innovation. Another great name in medieval medicine was Al-Razi, who worked in Baghdad in the 9th century. Legend has it that he hung lumps of meat all around the city. And he went and inspected them, and where the meat rotted most slowly, that's where he sighted his hospital. In fact, the very idea of a hospital comes from that time. He aimed to provide all sorts of facilities, from treatment and convalescence to asylum and retirement home. And actually, the hospitals then were very much precursors of the NHS because treatment was available for rich and poor and as a Muslim you're on a bound to care for the sick. But al Razi's greatest leap forward was in basic hygiene. Islam places a high value on cleanliness, and the ritual of washing your hands and feet before you go into a mosque is strictly observed. That's why there are so many fountains outside them. But cleanliness in general was also expected. In the year 993, there were 1,500 public baths like this one in the city of Baghdad. Besides washing and socializing, Bathing was also about spiritual purification. But it's difficult to keep properly clean without soap. The classical world lacked effective detergents and used anything from olive oil to pumice stones to keep clean. 
But in the 9th century, Arazi mentions that hard soap was already in wide use in bathhouses like this. In Europe, at the same time, soap was unheard of, and people either stayed dirty or washed in water. It wasn't until the 18th century that Europeans cleaned up their act. A recently discovered manuscript from the 13th century actually details the recipe for making soap, but that's all they knew. How and why it worked would remain a mystery for centuries. That ancient recipe suggests you make soap by taking dark sesame oil and heating it up with potash and alkali, that's another Arabic word, and lime. But actually, it doesn't need to be as complicated as that. Let me show you. What you need is some oil, and this is ordinary cooking oil. And I'll slosh a bit of that in there. And some caustic soda. Here we are, sodium hydroxide. And we'll bung that lot in there. Don't get it on your hands. And we stir that up a bit. And then I'll put it on the fire here. And you need to heat this up, preferably without boiling it, for an hour or two. And after a bit, it goes sort of gloopy like this one, a bit like porridge. And when you reckon it's about as thick as it's going to get, you take it out and let it cool. And what you wind up with is hard soap. You have to put it in a dish to cool, preferably non-stick. And this is what you wind up with. Look at this. Lovely hard soap. And what they discovered was that to get hard soap, you don't use potash, potassium hydroxide. You use sodium hydroxide, caustic soda. Look at that. And you add a little pinch of salt, and that gives you lovely hard soap. Let me explain to you how it works. Oil comes in long, ribbon-like molecules, like that. This might be oil or grease. They're actually hydrocarbon chains, these, and they don't dissolve in water. They're hydrophobic. They don't like water. Soap, a soap molecule, this is magnified a million, million, million times or something like that, has tails that look like oil molecules, long, thin hydrocarbon tails that are hydrophobic. But it also has a hydrophilic end. This is like water. This enjoys water and will dissolve in water. So it's a combination of the two. When you get dirt on your skin, it's always mixed with the natural grease and oil that's on your skin, and all the dirt sticks with the grease, and if you put that in water, it doesn't come off because the grease won't dissolve in the water. But if you use a soap molecule, the, the hydrophobic ends mix with the grease, because it's the same sort of stuff, and pick up the dirt. And when you go into the water, then the hydrophilic end dissolves in the water, comes away, and pulls the tails with it, pulls the grease off your hand, and takes the dirt along with it. All over the Islamic world, chemists were in great demand. Their discoveries had brought innovations and great wealth. Apart from oils, perfumes and medicines, there was one sinister development in the 9th century that would profoundly change the world. This is the Al-Qasaba, or castle, of Almeria in southern Spain. Built by the Umayyad Caliph, Abdul al-Rahman III, in 995 AD. For nearly 500 years, it dominated the most successful trading port in the region and was also the base of the powerful Umayyad naval fleet. Here as elsewhere, the Caliph's power lay in the weapons he could command. Developments in 9th century chemistry meant that some had access to the most fearsome devices of the time. Exactly who invented gunpowder is a contentious issue. The Chinese certainly developed saltpeter, one of gunpowder's ingredients, but it seems that at first they only used it for fireworks. Other research has shown that Muslim chemists developed a powerful formula for gunpowder and may well have used it in the first firearms. But one thing's for certain, whoever was responsible probably had no idea how profoundly it would change the course of civilization. For the Islamic armies led by Saladin in 1249 AD, the mastery of gunpowder in war proved decisive. 
At the Battle of Mansoura in Egypt, Muslim incendiary devices were so terrifying and destructive that the French Crusader army was routed and King Louis IX was taken prisoner. An Arab scholar from Syria, Hassan al-Rama, wrote a book about military technology. He called it the Book of Horsemanship and Ingenious War Devices. And he described in it all sorts of things like guns, cannons, rockets, pistols, grenades, and the world's first torpedo. Now, out there is an enemy warship and we've launched our torpedo straight at it. I don't think they've noticed. So with luck, we can destroy that ship just like that. The device, first mentioned in Al Rama's book around 1295 AD, was a cleverly modified rocket designed to skim along the surface of the water. Made from sheet iron, it was packed with oil, metal filings and saltpeter. The rocket tails at the back also acted as rudders while the spear at the front was designed to lodge the torpedo in the wooden hull of the enemy ship. It's a tense moment. Wow! <laughs> I think we can safely say that is now an X ship. If it hasn't sunk already, it'll be down in minutes, I would say. Fantastic. The Arab and Muslim world has had a profound and lasting influence on our lives today. The list is long and full of surprises. But perhaps the most important thing that the Islamic Empire did for us was to preserve, refine and improve all the knowledge left by the scholars of the ancients. And without that work by the Muslim scholars, all of that knowledge might have been lost and our lives would have been much the poorer. To receive a free Open University leaflet which accompanies this series and details of Open University programmes, telephone 0870 900 0352 or go to bbc.co.uk slash history. Next time, join me to explore the golden age of ancient Chinese technology. The Chinese have the oldest civilization in the world and they invented many things long before the West, from paper to kites and from gunpowder to bridges.